Hi, I'm John Pulo, Managing Editor for Cigar Advisor Magazine, and today we're back with another round of five cigars that made my career. And today, Alan Rubin from Alec Bradley Cigars has joined us to sit down in the hot seat <laughs> and go over, for better or worse, mm -hmm. the five or so, we say or so because it always ends up being more than five, okay. usually closer to ten, that got you to where you are today. So okay. we'll take kind of a walk down memory lane, look at some of these cigars that have kind of shaped where you've gone, and give us a little bit of a backstory or some interesting thing that happened along the way that made that cigar stand out as a big point in your career. Okay. So, John, so uh, first of all, there were a couple of cigars before I ever got in the industry mm -hmm. that, uh, that really drew me to cigars. One was the cigar itself, and one was the experience of the cigar. Mm -hmm. So the first one was that uh, my one of my very close friends, my roommate in college, my roommates in college, uh, their father was a very prominent businessman in South Florida uh, of Cuban heritage, mm -hmm. always had cigars on his desk. Uh, we'd go to his downtown office and uh, see you know beautiful humidor on his desk, and I was always intrigued. And one day he he said to me, Alan, do you want do you want a, a cigar? I was 22. And I said, I'd love to try it. And he gave me uh, two cigars. He gave me a Cuban cigar and a Dominican cigar. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he said, okay, this one you can smoke at any time. And then the other one he said, you know, kind of don't operate heavy equipment type of feel. <laughs> so okay. so I, I smoked the first one. And, I, and you know, it's my first cigar. I, it, was a, it, was a, it was a Partagas uh, Dominican okay. that he gave me. And then a, a Cuban uh, oh, Partagas as well. Okay. So. I was in my office back then. You could smoke in your offices. Sure. I was you know, still a young young guy, and uh, I smoked it. And I was kind of just intrigued with the flavor that you were getting out of these leaves. You know, I didn't understand it, but I was intrigued. And then I remember I waited a little bit of time, and a couple of weeks went by, and I was in my office on a Saturday doing some work, and I said, "I'm going to light up this other cigar," and uh, I got a call on a Saturday to check some inventory. So I was smoking the cigar, uh, sitting at my desk, and I got up, and I had to climb up three rungs on a ladder to check some inventory, and I almost fell off the ladder. And I, and I was like, what is this? Yeah. And then my curiosity was truly piqued. So those were, those were some cigars that ultimately affected my life because I didn't understand how mm -hmm. I could get that feeling and what that flavor was, and so that was the intriguing part from the beginning. But then I started to learn cigars, go to the cigar stores, pick up different cigars, became very friendly with my tobacconist right, ultimately. Right. And then uh, in my other business, I was still a pretty young guy, and I was going into a meeting bidding on a contract between me and four very large companies. And mm -hmm. the owner was in his 60s, and he worked with his son, and I worked with my father at the time. And uh, he called me into his office, and I was prepared to give a presentation. And he said, uh, he goes, son, do you smoke cigars? And I said, I do. Yes, I do. And he pulled out a cigar mm -hmm. for each of us, and we talked for three hours. Really? Talked about family, what it was like me working with my father, him working oh. with his son, and ultimately I got the contract. Nice. And, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to bet I was not the least expensive guy bidding, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of large companies, you know, four, three other large companies I was bidding against. But we made a connection, and he knew I'd be there for him. And he, it was, all, and it was all over that cigar. Mm -hmm. It would have just been a business deal until the cigar came. Until the cigar gave us an opportunity to get to know yeah. one another. Because I know one of the things you've discussed uh, a lot of times, whether it be out in public, at shows, at in-store events, making lives better one cigar at a time. Yeah. So that is that where that came from? Yeah. I mean, I what I understood, I think after that meeting and that time with him was that cigars are more than just dead leaves rolled up for us to enjoy, right? Um, there's a relaxation. You're almost never alone when you have a cigar. You almost kind of always have a friend with you. Uh -huh. it's, a, it's, it's that kind of meditative piece. And it makes, you know, we've always said that cigars break barriers and build bonds amongst people. Right. And so there was, you know, I was, I was in my late 20s, I believe, or very early 30s, and he was in his 60s. Yet we spent three hours mm -hmm. talking. Just so you sit and relax. And and I I started to understand the power of what was in front of me, right. and that's what really 
drew me into wanting to be in the business. And then about being the best hour of your day, there's a lot of pressure that goes along with that because if you're smoking one of the, you know, one of our cigars, there are certain expectations. So the last thing I want to do is let people down when it comes to that. So. Gotcha. All right. So first was both sides of the partagas. Mm -hmm. Now, did you notice a difference right away? Yeah, you know, I was a pretty novice cigar smoker, right? right. So, I, I think back then it was just the difference, maybe the, you know, the uh, the nicotine content uh -huh. back then and whatever it was. It's not like I was noticing big flavor differences. I didn't really understand that part, but I definitely got a little head buzz off of it. Nice. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So, Partagas is your first. Yeah. So, what would you, what would you say was the next? What stood out next as far as your, let's call it a journey, for lack of a better word? So, you know, I was, uh, when I got in the business, uh, I actually incorporated in 96. We sold our first cigars on golf courses in 97. And I really didn't get into the premium business to the very beginning of 2000. And uh, That's tail end of the boom. A tough time to get in, right? Yeah, there were 300 million cigars imported and 200 million consumed. And I'm like, hey, this is a good business to get into. <laughs> <laughs> what could go wrong? Right, right. Uh, you know, everyone asked me, how'd you get in the cigar business? I said, a, a, a series of consecutive bad decisions. <laughs> <laughs> good. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I started and, and for sure struggled, uh, you know, as we all have, everyone in the cigar business, you know, when you're first getting started. And, and then what happened was I, I met a guy who is still my executive vice president today, Ralph Montero, and Ralph had uh -huh. been in the business since he was 18. He was struggling and I was struggling, and then uh, we actually met almost by, and I don't believe in, in chances, right? You, we kind of crossed uh -huh. at, at a place in Miami and exchanged business cards, and ultimately he's been you know, with me ever since. But uh -huh. um, he was friends with Hanky Kellner. Okay. And Hanky, the boom was over, and they were looking for production. Right. right. And uh, and Hanky said he would make me a cigar, and uh, I could barely, literally, barely afford the samples. And uh, okay. so I think I ordered a thousand cigars, and we sent. I bought these silver tubes, mailing tubes. I bought uh -huh. 500 silver mailing tubes, and I put two cigars in each, and sent them to 500 retailers, and with no price list. And then and then followed up and we ended up with 250 accounts and that no saved kidding. that saved us so so was that a good phone call to place back down to hanky said hey buddy yeah uh, i mean you know and hanky and i've had a great relationship ever since he is a true gentleman um but so ultimately it was and even the name i, I mean i would never truly name a cigar occidental reserve but the name, i said hanky what is it that you want to achieve out of this deal he said, I'd like to kind of build the name of my factory as well. Right. It was called Occidental, was the name of the factory. Mm -hmm. So we did Occidental Reserve. And so that was a game changer for us, right? Because mm -hmm. that kind of kept us in business. Um, if we look at the next one, I can tell you a story about this, was uh, we had coming off that, that cigar, which was a mild cigar, you know, beautifully rolled, obviously, coming mm -hmm. from Hanky. From yeah, still around today. Too. Yeah. Um, was we came out with a cigar called Havana Sun Grown. Okay. And that was our first foray into a stronger, heavier cigar. And actually, for Hanky and those guys, they didn't really roll uh, anything with real power. You know, even okay. today, they've really expanded their lineup, but uh, they didn't roll a lot of heavy stuff. And so we worked with them to create something heavier, and then that gave us a little momentum off there. The next big hit was Max. Max. Which is still around today. That's right. Max came out in what year ish? That's a good question. I don't know. Uh, early 2000s. Okay. Because I know people are always asking, still to this day, about the trilogy. Because mm -hmm. that, that was a special shape. I mean, nobody had really done that. Yeah. So, first, when it came to Max, we rolled all these larger ring gauges 60 right. by 6 and 3 eighths. We were one of the first people to ever roll large ring gauges. Mm -hmm. and, and at that time, I sold all the cigars for the same price no matter what size they were. So as long as you wanted big or bigger, that's it was it. X dollars per That's cigar. correct. And I think at that time it sold for $5 at retail. All cigars. I mean, we had a uh, like a 50 by 9 and a quarter. We had a 60 by 6 and 3 eighths. Wait, 9 and a quarter, like yeah. long. We went AA. <laughs> <laughs> that was like a four-hour cigar. Yeah, and, and people loved it. Yeah. Today we have a large cigar out there because uh, uh, we had a, one size was called the Freak. And then right. we had a larger cigar. Now they call it the Super Freak, 
actually I think they're referring it to as the Rick James right now. But nice. Um, so Max was a big hit because we had all these large sizes that everyone can you know at that retail buy for five bucks, and that was a big mo momentum push. And then and then Trilogy came out. Right. So tell, just so everybody knows, tell us a little what special about Trilogy and what went into making that. So we were working on different blends, and ultimately we came out with three blends we really liked, but we were only going to launch one line. So I had three blends that we really couldn't decide what, what was going to come out and which one we were going to pick. So we had three blends, and then I had gone on a, on a, on a business trip. Um, it was actually a fishing trip I was invited on, and there were a lot of cigar manufacturers. There were like four or five other cigar manufacturers on this trip, uh -huh. and they were all experienced in the business, so I just did a lot of listening. And somebody had said to me, you know, you, you can't just come out with another round cigar. There's plenty in the market. So that got me thinking, and then I went to, uh, I remember thinking, well, no one's done a triangular cigar, maybe we should do that. Just kind of cool, and right. and I, you know, Different. back then, 54 ring gauges were not the norm, right? right? It was all 50 ring gauge, 46, and what I found was is that you could roll a larger cigar, and if you pressed it into this soft-sided triangle, it actually felt like a smaller cigar. So I didn't know how to do it, so I actually created some angles and did some drawings, and I went to Home Depot, and they were demoing a DeWalt table saw. Okay. And I said, does this thing cut angles? And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get some, go, you know, pick some wood out of the pile, and then I'll cut it for you. So I actually had him cut stuff on angles, and, uh, <laughs> and I glued them together, brought them back to the office, glued them yeah. together, and I had a press. I had yeah. a vise on, on our, one of our workbenches. Right. And started pressing cigars in the back, you know, the back of my warehouse. So the guy at Home Depot built your cigar he, mold. Yeah, I, and I, I actually still have it. I still have that mold. Uh, and then we went down to the factories, and they thought it was nuts. And we did bright packaging, so we had uh -huh. three sizes, um, three sided, uh -huh. and three blends, and that was our trilogy. And that was a huge game changer. You know, we did brightly colored packaging. Right. We used to get emails like, "Oh, that doesn't roll off my hot tub," you know. It was, People right, were really right, right. digging the whole piece, and that it was different, and that that put us in uh, uh, you know hundreds and hundreds of stores. Nice, yeah, nice. Uh, okay, all right, I'm looking at some of the different you know some of the different brands: Black Market, Black Market Esteli mm -hmm. that came up more recently, the Connecticut, the Coyol, uh, Nicopuro, Mundial, um, Pranzado, Post Embargo, Temp. I have to read the list because it's <laughs> this long now. Tempest, Lineage, Max, of course, as we talked about. Fine and rare, by the way, the fine and rare 2018, mm -hmm. 10 different tobaccos. What the hell, man? Uh, well, is it okay, because so you can? Let's, let's, start with the, let's start with the fact that I sold all these big cigars for one price, and then I yeah. came out with a triangular shaped yeah. cigar. Yeah. And normally, when you're blending you know, a cigar, it's a give and take, right? Mm -hmm. Is that you want to you build a little more impact, or a little more balance, or a little more sweetness. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we kind of just kept building. And building and building and until we found something we like but if you're using 10 tobaccos it's going to be the size of a baseball bat ultimately right. so then we have to figure out how to make it and so what we do is if you know the way the leaves grow and how the nutrients fill where you know where the flavors are mm -hmm. we actually cut the outer band where all the flavor is in the leaf and so each leaf is actually cut a certain way oh, really okay. and we use 10 different tobaccos to build fine and rare. Interesting. Yeah, I think we are the only cigar in the world to use that many tobaccos. I was going to say, it's, yeah. that's setting a, a new high bar. All right, uh, I, help me out here, because I, I am no linguist. T-R-O-J-E-S. Trojes. Pronounce it. Trojes. Now tell us what it is, because I see it on, uh, uh, on many of your blends. Yeah, so uh, we work uh, we work with some factories down in Central America, but in Honduras, Raices uh, is the factory that we use predominantly, and uh, we take about 90% of the production out of that factory. So we have a tremendous amount of, of control and influence, but truly they're family. I mean, it's family. It's a collaboration. And so when it came to growing tobacco, we started with them many, many years ago, and they started a project, project growing in the Nicaraguan Valley, the Jalapa Valley, but on the Honduran side of the border. And that area okay. is Trojas. So that's what we call our tobacco because that's the area that we grow in. Got it. So, and we have, from the, from the day that we tried that tobacco, uh -huh. we've been funding that tobacco ever since. What's, 
in a nutshell? Because uh, uh, tastes are always subjective. What's what's the ideal taste profile of Trumpus? So you have the sweetness that's predominantly known in the Jalapa Valley, mm -hmm. but it also has a, a great amount of nutrients in the soils there. Mm -hmm. And so there's a, a great la a level of flavor. Well, we, you know, we, we use a term called quantity of flavor in our office, is how much flavor can we get out of the tobacco, okay. right? So we, it's not necessarily about strength, it's not necessarily about sweetness, it's about quantity of flavor for us, and then we play with that. So we felt like this tobacco was rich, and it was flavorful, and it, it was very satisfying on its own, and something that we could blend with. Mm -hmm. So it's got a natural sweetness to it, but it also has a lot of, just a lot of flavor to it. Mm -hmm. So you don't get a lot of that mildness out of it. So you have to blend with it, you know, you blend mm -hmm. with it to, to, to use that as your base flavor a lot, or especially in the wrapper that we do. We, we put a lot of predominance in our, in our wrapper, mm -hmm. and we just think that, that Trojas is a very complete tobacco. Got it. Okay. So we left off at Trilogy. Mm -hmm. So what would you say, because that's still going back a number of years, there have been some obviously big milestones. We haven't even gotten to 2011 yet. <laughs> So, what would you say was is as as the journey of Alan Rubin has continued? Where was it? Where was the next big stop? Without a question, Tempest. Okay. Tempest was our next hit. Uh, it it in terms of giving us uh, the exposure that any company wanting to grow would look for, Tempest was it. And actually, it was very interesting. I remember being with another cigar manufacturer, uh, just at, at a cigar store. And I handed him a cigar, and he turned to me, and he's like, "You have something. This is this is special." So was that the moment you knew that it was just like? Yeah. Well, uh, so I'll tell you a story. We were up in the factory, and we were, we were blending it, and it was, uh, it was a small area. It was up in our little like conference area. Yeah. And I'd say the room was maybe twelve by twelve, and there were five of us smoking, and the door shut. Oh boy. And I, I'm smoking this little uh, Corona Gorda of this blend that we did, and I started to. You know, there's like not enough air. <laughs> there's not <laughs> enough oxygen, and uh, and I said, you know, I have to ex I have to excuse myself. I and like, oh, you have to go to the bathroom. I'm like, yeah, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> I just needed to get out of the room and get right, some air. Right. And I was like, I can't believe the impact of this tobacco. Right. Again, a lot of trojas, right? But can't believe the impact of the tobacco. And I said, what's strange is like, if we're in a room and we're blending, I'm always the last one to light because I want to smell the aromatics in the air first to see if I like okay. that. Interesting. And then if I like that and it, it's it's alluring to me, uh -huh. then I light up and see where we are. Okay. But I just had a feeling like this cigar was special. It was different. So the next day, instead of smoking there, we smoked at the house across the street at our house across the street. Right. And I said, "Hey, why don't we why don't we sit outside?" <laughs> <laughs> And I lit up the cigar again, and I said, "I've never, we've never made anything like this before. This is, oh, okay. this is, this is where we need to go. This is right. the future of our company." And uh, I turned to Ralph, who was sitting on, you know, just on the other side of the table. I didn't even say anything. He looked at me, and I looked at him, and I just kind of shook my head, and he shook his head, and we're like, "Okay, this is it." Right. And uh, that was the beginning of Tempest. That was our first top twenty-five cigar of the year. And actually, last year, it, Temp Tempest took number five cigar of the year. Yeah. yeah. So, and that's also probably the closest to my heart in terms of what it has done for our company. Okay. Uh, so Tempest, and that's probably what I smoke the most of. You know. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. So two things. One is you, you jumped a little bit ahead because I was eventually going to ask you what is the favorite what is the, your favorite cigar you've made? And I know that's always asking somebody, what's your favorite child? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting because um, I smoke my competitor cigars too. I'm a cigar guy. You yeah. know, if I wasn't making them, I'd still be smoking them. It's still my hobby. So I smoke a lot of different cigars. And really, it's not that I have a favorite because it also depends on time of the day, whether I'm smoking something a little bit milder, a little bit heavier. Uh, and sometimes I'll go into our humidor with nothing in mind. And and just whatever kind of calls out to me, right. and I'll pick up and smoke. So, but it happens to be that I always keep, I always keep Tempest Natural, Tempest Nicaragua, uh -huh. uh, our new uh, Prensado Lost Art. I smoke a lot of. So, uh -huh. kind of that's a lot of my my profile, I think, for me. Got it. Now, when you're blending, why Corona Gorda? Because I know some people 
choose Toros, some people choose Robustos. Well, ba back then, yeah. you know, X amount of years ago, people were smoking 50 ring gauges. So I could always go from a 46 to a 50. Now people are smoking 52, 54s, so right. now I blend on a 50. Okay. So I like to, because I like to know what that concentration of flavor is. And how we make cigars is that we actually adjust the blends per size. Mm -hmm. We find a profile on a certain size, and then we blend from there. So uh, I just, you know, I'm not much of a 54, and I will smoke 54s, but I'm more of a 50 ring gauge, maybe 52 right. ring gauge guy. Okay. And re ultimately, if I, even though they don't, the market doesn't embrace smaller ring gauges as much, mm -hmm. I mean, Lanceros and 46s is, is my go-to if I had my choice in terms mm, of, okay. but if I make, you know, I'll make uh, you know, 500 cigars of a blend that I like in Lancero or Corona Gorda just for, just for you, just for, and just for my, uh, and my kids. Right, right. If I can, then I have to steal them from them because. They're just keeping them safe for that you. Is, that's, that's what they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> We're just holding it on, that, on to, exactly what on they to tell me. Uh, for you, Dad, yeah. no problem. Uh, all, right, all right, so a discussion like this obviously has to make its way to Prensado. And I'm assuming that's probably next on your list. Yes, for sure. So, what happens when you get a number one cigar, or, or when you're when you're when one of your cigars is chosen as number one cigar of the year? I mean, do they make a phone call? Do they send a letter, singing telegram? I mean, what what happens when it's like, hey, good news, Alan? Yeah, none of that. Nothing. Not one. So it's I, I find out when everyone else finds out. Really? Yeah. So, and I'll tell you that story. I was. Um, I remember the week, you know, when the, the top 25 counts down, and I think it starts on a Tuesday, 10, 9, 8, yeah. and we weren't in there. And then yeah. Wednesday is 7, 6, 5, and we weren't in there, you know, and I get to my office and I'm like, no, we're not 7, 6, 5. And then Thursday is 4, 3, 2, and we're not in there. And I remember getting ready to go to work on Friday morning, uh -huh. and, uh, and my wife says to me, hey, why don't you stay? They're announcing number one at, at 10 a.m. I said, yeah, yeah, I'm just, I'm going to go to work and, you know, hopefully on Monday we're at least 11 through 25 because it's a great accolade to be there. Sure. And uh, she said, no, 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 wait. And I said, I'm just, let me, I'm just going to go to work. And she said, no, I want you to stay. And, uh, and my son came in to the room with his laptop and just hit refresh. <laughs> and it, and at 10 o'clock our band was there. No. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Interesting, because I've told this story, you know, multiple times, but even telling it now, sitting here with you, uh, you know, it's it's emotional. Sure. Me. It is. Because, uh, you know, look, how we many all, years of work and yeah. everything else that goes into and we that? All, and, and we all work hard. You know, sure. cigar manufacturers, I mean, it's a hard-working group of people, and uh, and for us to get that was, was pretty incredible. Um, so, and, you know, I don't... I didn't know that liquor stores are open at 10 a.m., but I <laughs> but I went there and I picked up yeah. I picked up two bottles of champagne for mm -hmm. my office, and uh, and I walked in and everyone was going crazy. The phones were off the hook. Mm -hmm. It was literally like a scene out of Wall Street. You know, it was like, yeah. oh, you want how many? Okay, 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 okay. And uh, and then I said for everyone, take 30 seconds. I want to congratulate all of you for all the hard work. But truth be told, the, the work starts right now. Mm -hmm. And let's go, and that was it. Now we were talking a little bit earlier. We now the factories shut down in December, and that list comes out. No, that list comes out in January. In January, yeah. so they're just ramping back up for production at that point. Actually, or? they're it's like that week, and then they start so in. So you get to make that phone call. Hey, guess what? Yeah, <laughs> all yeah. those prensados. Time to start moving. Yeah, starting time to start making. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, it's it's a game changer. It's yeah. it you know it's everything that you would think it would be. What's the next milestone after number one cigar of the year? Well, you know we've we've launched a series of brands, and it's really been great in the fact that um, you know the consumers you know, that we deal with uh, have just been very accepting of us, accepting of our brand, mm -hmm. uh, ex accepting of our of our. Our, our group of people, kind of our Alec Bradley family, and so we've we've seen a really nice continued momentum, you know, momentum, but more manageable. Mm -hmm. Coming off number one, that was a year and a half that was not manageable, so we had to bring that down, get some things right, get some processes in place, fix things that were wrong. You know, what happens is when you're when you're handling and you can manage the growth, 
the problem stays small. Uh -huh. when, when you get this huge spike, everything that was small becomes a lot larger. And so we had to fix a lot of things, and we did that. And, um, but truly the next milestone for me has nothing to do with our cigars. It's the okay. fact that the company's named Alec Bradley after my two sons, and they're now in the business with me. Okay. I, I, I say they went from being on the payroll to being on the payroll. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so this has become a full-blown family affair. Unbelievable, yeah. Okay, so talk a little bit about their first, their, they have their own debut, mm -hmm. a cigar of their own. Tell us a little bit about it. So I told both my sons, I told Alec and Bradley both, you have a choice to make, mm -hmm. kind of a life choice to make. You can either be known as Alan's kids, right, or you can be known as Alec and Bradley. Mm -hmm. But that's all on your work ethic and what you put in and your passion towards the industry and what you're willing to give in to get try and get something out. You know, what you give in is is going to be commensurate to what you get back out. And so I said, you need to feel some of the struggles that I felt. You need to get some of the rejections and some of the disappointments. You need to feel all that so you know what success feels like as well. And I said, I think you should come up with your own line. And I said, I will be here to help you if you ask. Okay. But I will not get involved in what you're doing unless you ask for my opinion. Have they asked? Well, <laughs> so, but the other as, part of that. As a son, as we always know we'd never want to ask. Well, correct. But the other part of that, as I said, you're going to invest your own money in the cigar line. Mm -hmm. So you have some skin in the game. You have something to lose. Ah. So if you want to get up and go to work, do it. If you don't, your call, but it's your money too. Right. So, and uh, that was the impetus behind them coming up with their line. The line is called uh, Blind Faith. Uh -huh. And actually, they don't even use the Alec Bradley logo. They use an A ampersand B for Alec and Bradley. Okay. Um, and um, they came to me. So, so I'll tell you this story, John, because this is kind of funny. They, uh -huh. they were going through blends, and ultimately everything they were smoking, I was smoking, just keeping my opinion to myself, which is not easy. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, they were deciding between, I think, the last two cigars, and they said, Dad, we're down to kind of the last two of what we really like, you know, what do you think? And I said, I'm not going to tell you that. Mm. I said, you guys are going to decide what you want to do. You will not compromise amongst each other, because if you compromise and it doesn't work, you both have failed. Mm -hmm. So therefore, you guys, have to, you guys have to decide how to get along, how to learn how to find the right formulas amongst yourself, and then when you decide on the cigar, bring it back to me. They told me the cigar they decided on, and they said, what do you think? And I said, this is the cigar that you've chosen for your line? And they said, yes. And they spent a lot of time down at the factories and the right. fields. I mean, they, they did their work without a question in terms of blending. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and I said, I, I love it. I said, as a matter of fact, if you decide not to use it, I think I'm going to take the blend. Because <laughs> I love the right. blend. Nice. And that was it. And, uh, uh, you know, they... I remember uh, Alec called me one day and he said, Dad, Bradley and I just are not seeing eye to eye. We're not, we're just not agreeing. Mm -hmm. And I said, great. He said, no, Dad, you didn't hear me. Mm -hmm. I said, we're not getting along. And I said, you didn't hear me. I said, great. And I said, right. you're at a young age where you can learn. You have to learn how to balance that. But again, you can't compromise, right? You have to, someone has to convince the other why it should be a certain way. And they did that hmm. from packaging to pricing, to how they're going to launch it. And right. we could only give them, without hurting our own productions, we could only give them three pair of rollers. That's all I was allowing them. So their production was limited because I wasn't yeah. going to just turn rollers over them. And um, I think they sold out their production in 10 weeks. No kidding. Yeah. Now, do you find that they have a bit of a different blending style when it comes to tastes than maybe you do? Yeah, yeah, which is great. I mean, they want to talk to their audience. You know, they're 26 yeah. and 23. Um, the packaging reflects a younger, kind of more fresh audience type feel. Mm -hmm. uh, the cigar has been well received. The sell through has been great. They're mm -hmm. doing it their way. They're marketing it their way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, they're blending it their way. It actually, they're working on their next project as well. Interesting. Now, the bar has been set, but do you think Blind Faith will be the best cigar that they've blended? That's a great question. Um, 
I guess that, I guess we'll see. Okay. Um, they're very focused. Yeah. You know, for for two young men at that age, and I love when people use the term millennial, like it's just one giant group and everyone's the same. Mm -hmm. It's not. Uh, I don't know what the, I don't know what that definition is exactly, but mm -hmm. um, I mean, my kids are very focused. They're 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 young. They're professional. They're out there. They're working hard. They are very exacting in what they want, which can cause a problem because they may not exactly be in a lot, you know, in alignment as to what they want. But right. they have found a way to come together, and they're doing it again now because I'm I, I'm hearing the, all the processes. I'm seeing everything as it's moving forward. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. What's the project that you still haven't done yet? Well, you know, we didn't do we didn't do a 20th anniversary because there was all the FDA stuff going yeah, on right. and we had to, you know, it was like make one line or get our company prepared. So mm -hmm. we didn't do that. There potentially could be maybe an, an Alan Rubin signature within mm -hmm. within the Alec Bradley line. Um, I'm, when I leave here, I'm home for a day and I'm down at the factories next week and we're, mm -hmm. we've been working on blends for about six months. So, you know, that could be right, something. Right. I, don't, I don't really need to, you know, to promote me. I, I, yeah. It's all about, you know, our brand. Um, but there's something maybe, maybe we would do okay. something like that. Because I always hate when these people say, "Don't ask me if I'm coming out with a new cigar." <laughs> <laughs> if people want new yeah. cigars, I'm going to come out with them. I mean, right. you know, it, the market. We have to listen to our consumers, and if they tell us they want us to do more, right. I'll give an example. We didn't have a lot of cigars that were kind of that mild, creamy, and I don't really use creamy, nutty type thing, but something right. really smooth and flavorful. And we came out with Metalist this year, uh -huh. and it's it's knocking it out of the park. People were waiting for us to come up with something in that profile, uh -huh. but we had to listen. So right. yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's our job is to, you know, we have territory managers around the country. Uh -huh. They are a spectacular group of people, um, hardworking, uh -huh. they care. And when they come back and tell us, hey, you know, people are asking if we have anything in this, kind of in this range, and we don't, well, then we get to work. So we've probably looked at, all right, probably closer to eight cigars <laughs> that have made yeah. Alan Rubin. Yeah, yeah. Um, those five special cigars are now eight. Have, have somehow become eight, but that's what happens here when we do this. Good. But uh, so that is our latest edition of five cigars that made my career with Alan Rubin. Alan, certainly appreciate the time. Thank you for John, joining thank us. Thank you. Always a pleasure. I appreciate man. it. Thank, thank you. you. And more online at cigaradvisor.com.